Hello everyone, welcome to our panel discussion on insurance moving ahead with tech disruption. With us, we have our panelists, Mr. Rajat Sharma, Corporate Vice President, Eva Tech Corporation, Mr. Sarabhir Singh, Chief Executive Officer, Policy Bazaar, Mr. Sachin Goyal, Chief Technology Officer and Head of Digital Data AIA Life Insurance. And to moderate our session, we have with us Mr. Joy Dean Roy, Global Leader, Insurance Digital Assets and Leader Insurance Practice, India PWS. Over to you, Mr. Roy. Thank you, Shreya. Good afternoon to everybody, to all my co-panelists, as well as to the audience. I'm sure you're having a very exciting day. Uh, it's a fantastic topic. Uh, the whole fintech, global fintech fest is a wonderful initiative. Uh, nothing is more interesting to everybody now than what opportunities lie on the other end of the peak that we are seeing now. Uh, well, in no discussion in these times can escape the extraordinary situation that we find ourselves in. And that while uh, COVID-19 has created a large uh, havoc all over the world, it has definitely given rise to two, two really massive opportunities. One lies in the field of environmental changing and, and environmental regeneration, while the other definitely is the acceleration of everything that is digital, that is online, that is technology and led by technology, the whole market, especially the financial services industry. So while we can mope around what, uh, what is wrong, uh, and since it's the 97th birth anniversary of the great singer Mukesh, who, who did say, sing Jane Kaha Gay Vodin, and we can keep on saying that. But I think we should take inspiration from his other song, which is Chala Kela, Chala Kela, Chala Kela. And that's how we have to move it forward. So we, instead of being cowed down by disruption, the topic is so very aptly named as moving ahead with technology disruption in the insurance industry. So. Welcome to every, everybody. I hope we're going to, uh, to provide you with thoughts, uh, really food for thought, something which will be provocative. Uh, I have a fantastic array of uh, panelists, as you're going to see in a moment. So to start it off, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Rajat, Rajat Sharma from eBiotech to come and uh, to actually present to us. And he has got a, a point of view of how one can move ahead with tech disruption and not get cowed down. Over to you, Rajat. Let's start the proceedings with you. Thank you so much, Joydeep. Uh, and I guess we'll not have to akela chal today. We have a good panel. So let's all uh, kind of enjoy this session today. So uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Rajat and I'm the corporate VP, global head of sales at Ebow Tech. Uh, people who don't know Ebow Tech, uh, we are in the business of making uh, insurance easy uh, and connected. Uh, Second part of my session, I'll be talking of InsureMo and how we're making this connected and how this hyper-connected world of insurance is getting uh, powered by us through InsureMo. Uh, but I have a couple of minutes and let me set a stage of uh, the discussion for today, which is disruption. And, you know, when we talk of disruption in tech, the first thing that comes to my mind is connectivity. We are living in a hyper-connected uh, environment today, right? So every industry is going through that massive uh, disruption of hyper-connectivity. Insurance obviously is no different, right? And in fact, I believe that insurance is far more under pressure than any other industry to be connected because insurance has to be embedded into other industries rather than working with the other industries, right? And that is where, uh, you know, insurance around two years, three years or four years back, we're used to work with the banks or agents or at max websites. Today, we are talking about hundreds, probably thousands of channels, you know, to connect and sell and embed insurance as part of it. So that is where I think uh, uh, the whole discussion of disruption uh, for me is connectivity. And that's where, you know, these numbers talk about it. Uh, 2000, the number of mobile devices have surpassed the human population. And I guess today it's probably 100 times, 200 times. So I don't even know that number. I've lost that count. If you look at a health ecosystem or an auto or a mobility ecosystem, right? Everything has huge amount of participants, right? And this is growing. It's not going to stop. These participants will keep on growing. And the pressure on insurance industry keeps on growing to be embedded as part of each and every participant here, right? And that is what we guys are trying to do as part of the uh, our our uh, our uh, uh, tech disruption as well. Uh, that is where APIs have gained a transaction. You know, it's it's kind of become a household name. Uh, I, I saw that the other day. You know, a four year old kid doing uh, uh, and creating an API on a on a mule sub platform. I was like shocked. Right, so that that probably is is a name which is changing the nature of all innovation. Uh, but how does insurance fit into this whole digital ecosystem? That's probably more important. 
uh, for insurance to understand and to fit into this ecosystem, I think let's understand how the whole super apps, you know, the whole uh, digital platforms or these e-commerce players actually drive, right? So while you see a single screen on the mobile, what goes underneath are APIs. They are reusable assets, right? They're connecting multiple industries, multiple assets into one uh, user experience. And I guess if insurance is to compete into that era, into that space, probably you need something like that. And what the way we see uh, that technology platform or a middle office platform is like a like a Rubik cube, right? And that is how the technology has to enable insurance companies, right? So if you look at the channel, a product and a service in a Rubik cube, and if you were to you know kind of make combinations, you need that flexibility and agility in a tech platform so that you can take any product, put it onto any channel, and give any service. So it can be a quotation service, it can be an endorsement service, it can be a claim service, it could be anything. And this could be multiple numerous in, uh, combinations on how you can offer this platform for insurance. That is uh, that is an era that we are moving into. We've enabled a lot of uh, players, uh, and we are excited to see that a lot of players are already moving into that direction. Finally, uh, middle office is a theme. is a theme that we've been riding over the last four years or so. We've been uh, we we are not even near to successful. Uh, while we, we, we've done a lot into the space, but I think middle office is what we strongly believe in. And uh, essentially, what we believe is that a core system or a back office system is not going to give you that connectivity to those millions of channels out there. And out of that, probably 90% would be crap. Probably 10% might make sense or give you even a cent of uh, insurance. The fact is, you don't want to miss out on them. So you still need a middle office that becomes your connectivity engine to your you know, ecosystem outside those beautiful leaves that you see. And that is what is something that insure more is. I'm not going to talk about it right now. I'm just going to leave the floor open here. Uh, leaving this from a middle office perspective, the next uh, later part of my discussion is all around that. A very quick overview of this periodic table. Uh, uh, so our founder is, is 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 fond of periodic tables, and that's why we structured this whole uh, insure more into this this sense. So the blue section is a product like a product factory. You should have millions of products that you can take up, uh, configure it in a you know second uh, and launch it through APIs, right? So these grays are the microservices the APIs, probably thousands of microservices the APIs that should be available. You should have pre-configured channels like the ones in yellow, right? And we have hundreds of pre-configured channels that you can pick, drop, and launch any of those products into those pre-configured channels. You need a lot of horizontal startups, uh, deep tech uh, capabilities, AI, machine learning, IoT, telematics. So that is what also brings into this whole platform. So that is where I think uh, I want to leave this floor back to Joydeep. Uh, and uh, probably, you know, uh, get the other panelists also involved and invoke their thoughts on that. Joydeep. Thanks, Rajat. Uh, that's very interesting to see, hear your views and what is really making the whole digital uh, fintech world move along. And the question of API as a fundamental block there is so is very critical. So as we move on, I mean, all of these technology and disruptions will be nothing if we can't solve the big social problem, which insurance is supposed to solve, which is protection for everybody. And India, as we all know, has a large protection gap in excess of 90% as measured. Uh, a couple of years back by some reinsurers that the whole protection gap, which means either you are insured or you're underinsured. So I'd like to hand over the floor to Sarveer, who is from Policy Bazaar. He's the CEO of Policy Bazaar and he sees the whole thing from consumer point of view. And uh, so Sarveer, how do you see the protection gap being bridged through technology disruption? And do you see finally a situation where uh, people are going to want to buy insurance finally? Yeah, thanks, Joydeep. Uh, I think as you mentioned, you know, this is a very often quoted number that we are 92% underinsured. So what does this really actually mean, right? And practically what it means is that people, you know, are not, if somebody were not to be there, they would not, their family would be 92% shy of what money they would need to live their current lifestyle. So it's important to understand what we are talking about here, which is that your current lifestyle to be maintained if you are not there. So that's really what this protection gap refers to. Uh, now, if, I, if we were to take a step back, right, the whole uh, ethos and vision of Policy Bazaar is to move insurance from being a push product to a pull product. Because traditionally, insurance has been sold man to man, person to person by agents. And then, you know, uh, they explain to people why you should buy. What we are saying is that people should see the need for insurance and they should come to our platform, compare policies, look at policies, be advised by well trained advisors, and then they should be able to buy a policy. Now, what the what this so we've been on this journey it's been over 12 years that we've been there, going on this journey now what has changed in the last uh, i would say four months is that insurance is something 
that we all would generally agree is good for us. But the problem is that many of us still don't buy it. And the reason for that is very simple. You pay upfront for a policy and you will get some return later on in your life, especially when you may not be there. So it's very hard to you know, get over this point and that's why it has remained a push product. And what has been seen is that things change when big incidents happen. So if one of your friends, let's say, goes to a hospital and ends up paying a five lakh rupee bill, you can bet that many of that person's friends will now buy health insurance. And COVID in that sense is the mother of all incidents. So what has happened is that suddenly all of us have woken up that death, disease, disability are not as far away from us as we originally thought. So which is the really the reason why people are looking for insurance and why, you know, what you said that it's a pull product versus a push product. Now, what are we seeing, right? If we, if we look at our platform, what are we seeing? What we are seeing is that our number of inquiries on our platform has gone up tremendously. So like literally month over month, they're going up between 40 and 60%. The second thing that we are seeing is that people are talking a lot more to the advisors. You know, uh, traditionally, you know, the sort of legend is that the advisor is chasing the consumer. But now in some cases, many times the consumer is, you know, really wanting to talk to the advisor. So our talk time has gone up. And finally, what we are seeing is that people are buying a lot more policies than they used to buy. So this is a journey. I think, you know, nothing moves from push to pull in span of months. But what COVID has acted on, maybe much like Y2K or something, has given it a bump up where people have suddenly realized that this is extremely important. And, you know, we are seeing the benefits of that. Thanks. Thanks, Saveed. That's That was really a very good insight into what's really happening because you are probably in the nerve center of it all as the most visited site. Uh, well, uh, it seems that one of the keys to, to working on this, succeeding in these times and beyond, is being digital. Now, there's a lot of talk of online and digital. So I'd like to ask Sachin, who is this Sachin Goyal, who's the CTO of Tata AI Life, a company which is com completing 20 years, is that, well, uh, Sachin, what do you think uh, is required to be geared up for uh, being online and be, or being digital? And what is the difference between the two? People talk of it interchangeably nowadays. Can you, can you elaborate a bit on this? Thank you. Thank you, Jaydeep. Uh, and first of all, thank you to the organizers for having me here. Uh, a very good point, uh, Jaydeep, that has come up so far, the, the significant protection gap uh, that we see in the country uh, today. And at Tata IIA, we're quite focused on that. We, we continue to uh, watch it closely. Uh, we're quite focused on addressing this gap by hugely simplifying the entire process using digital. Now, uh, as you, as you uh, alluded to, digital is a little different from online in the sense that it is automation plus some more. So in the context of insurance, it's about the product, the process, the policies, and the ecosystem. To give you an example, we leverage digital to create real-time integrations with our channel partners and providers such that entire journey is simplified. The customer has to furnish fewer pieces of information and documents. Similarly, fixing of medical appointments happens in real time. In quite a few cases, those are substituted with telemedicals. Uh, Rajat did talk about the API, so the entire API economy that, that we often hear about uh, in different forums. You know, that's, that's becoming quite real. Uh, when you leverage APIs to integrate multiple organizations, bringing a service together to make it uh, easier for the consumer. And that's what we've, we've managed to do. Now, now protection is a business where uh, you're writing, underwriting fairly large risk, and which is why you would need to uh, need to be quite prudent. But at the same time, you can still simplify the process for the customer. Quite like a food delivery platform, you'll find the entire process highly simplified, completely transparent to ensure delightful customer experience. Now, let me give you another example. Uh, I mean, some customers might find insurance uh, as a little more complicated process. Now, to, to ensure there's enough transparency, uh, one, there the digital platforms provide enough information for the customer to to familiarize himself. In addition, uh, at Tata AIA we have a, a video PSC process where a video is also recorded along with the customer to make sure the customers really understood 
the product that's being that's being purchased. So so just to bring it back together, uh, digital and online. While while you could do simple automation, but when you bring the entire organization together, which means the process, the product. Uh, and the entire ecosystem together to create a platform which helps the customer get information on fingertips, look at the end-to-end -end experience that the customer gets. That's really what digital is. And that is where we've been seeing a lot of uh, value coming out of our, our investments in digital. Thank you, Sachin. The, the, so, so digital and online uh, stands deciphered <laughs> to an extent by, as people keep on, you know, Talking about them in the same breath, and thanks for uh, talking about the differences. How it really plays a part as companies gear up for a post-COVID world too. So it, let me let me ask you one more question here, Sachin, because you have been implementing digital uh, initiatives. You, de you deal with a whole lot of agents. You deal with bank issuance partners, and at the same time, you also have have a lot of digital assets of your own and you want people to uh, align to a digital process how easy or difficult it is to convince people to use digital methods vis-a-vis -vis, uh, either merely online or bordering on offline processes while selling and or servicing great great question uh, joydeep and i must say uh, there is a pre-covid era and a post-covid era while COVID brought so many challenges, uh, it has a silver lining also for digital. Uh, now, if you see, there is a natural pull for digital. Uh, you'll see everyone starting from the youngest in the family to the oldest becoming really comfortable uh, with digital. For a long time, we'd, we'd heard various challenges in digital adoption, the most prominent one being uh, lack of infrastructure, technology infrastructure and connectivity uh, across the country. But I think people have now discovered the ubiquity of uh, broadband and high-speed mobile networks. So I think the, the challenges are well addressed and uh, everyone in the country has has really understood it's here and, and how beneficial it is. If I, if I bring it closer to business, uh, we've been quite fortunate to have our digital platforms ready and already in use in various channels uh, uh, when COVID came in. But as it, as it came in, distributors who were thus far not on digital, were very quick to adopt uh, the digital platforms, uh, whether it is for digital prospecting or for customer servicing needs, etc. Uh, so, so basically, uh, what has happened is uh, the simplicity that these platforms have brought in, how these have enabled distributors to sell more to address the customer needs more appropriately is what has created this pull. If I can use, use another uh, very relevant example here, we see a very high level of engagement with the customers. Uh, and when I look at the buying process, I, I think a key reason for that would be the sales process is focused on addressing the customer needs more than the product itself. Uh, so in our process, there is a suitably, suitability analysis that is conducted when the customer is buying the policy to ensure the selected product suits the customer needs. Now, that's something that, that the distributors like as well as the, the customer loves it as well because you, digital is actually helping you uh, enhance customer engagement and helping you address the customer needs in the appropriate manner. So, so really, if you see uh, adoption, that has gone up multifold, uh, clearly on the back of the benefits that it is offering to both distributors and customers. Now, when it comes to servicing side, uh, the variety of touch points that digital has now offered for uh, servicing the customer, that has created a very natural pull. Now, now, a lot of customer servicing now is happening on WhatsApp platform for us. That's so convenient for the customer. We've all used these platforms in our uh, normal life. And, and uh, we, we now see these things working seamlessly and, and so effortlessly in a corporate environment. So I think, once again, even, even on the customer servicing side, uh, digital has really proven uh, the value that it brings in. Thank you, Sachin. And therefore, the twin uh, worries that if anybody who is deploying technology or any kind of digital tools, which are adoption engagement, uh, are, are coming up and will keep coming up and we have to keep conquering them. So before moving to, the, uh, to survey on customer engagement, I have a question from the audience, and this is a nice question. 
just the, the, the question has come from somebody who's anonymous at this point of time, which is what are the new cutting edge technologies that are disrupting the insurance industry? So if I may quickly ask, bring in Rajat here, and you know, uh, Sir V, then I will move to you and we'll continue on the customer engagement. But very quickly, Rajat, what are the new and really new stuff that you're seeing in the COVID times? The deep tech is obviously there, and that's what uh, the whole ecosystem play comes for us. We created a marketplace, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, telematics, right? These were all happening in silos. And what we believe, and I, I think we are all hearing that the amount of innovation which has happened in the last three months has not even happened in the last three years, right? So we've seen real use cases of artificial intelligence, not fake use cases, real use cases which are actually delivering value to the customer. Telematics has grown big time, you know, smart cars or smart health is actually coming to fore. So I, I believe all of that stuff is getting embedded as part of insurance somewhere or the other. And I'm sure, you know, uh, Sachin and Sarbhi, they're all would be seeing some or some of these aspects somewhere into their daily lives as well. Right. So to Sarbhi, then it's a segue to, uh, to you, you know, combining both where Sachin left off and what Rajat said. How do you see these technologies, which are really disruptive ones, creating consumer engagement in a category which never you know, caught the fancy of anybody. It was the last thing that people want to buy or wanted to buy. How do we engage customers using these newer technologies in the future? Yeah. So, so Joydeep, I have a view on this that, you know, while we, uh, while, you know, the technology finally has to be the servant of man, right? It's not the other way around. And I think what, what we really mean by having artificial intelligence, deep tech, whichever, you know, word you want to use, what we are really trying to move towards is personalization at a mass scale. If you see the way things have worked out earlier, it was not possible to personalize at a mass scale. And we were all taught uh, in our marketing books and Kotler and stuff like that, that you have to segment customers and, you know, there are these, you know, buckets of people and things like that. And what these technologies are allowing us to do is to actually get rid of all that and say that I can actually simply fully understand what Mr. Joydeep Roy is all about. What is his context? Why is he here? What should be the best product for him? So at Policy Bazaar, what we are trying to do is that we have all this data and all these technologies with us. But what we are trying to move towards is what is the consumer there for and to design relevant consumer, you know, insights and campaigns or discussions with them. Actually, In fact, I think the use of the old marketing terminology like campaign and all is actually uh, wrong because I think the what we really want to have is a discussion with them. So now the traditional answer to your question would be to go into things like we will do a webinar and, you know, we will do this and we will send you a drip campaign and, you know, all those various things which uh, are well understood. And, and we are doing all of that. So I think I'm the first to admit that, you know, we have not reached the you know 22nd century yet. We are doing all of that also. But what we are trying to move towards is to understand your context and to say that, look, you have bought this policy from us. We see that you have two children. Maybe you just added that your wife, you know, and you got married on so and so date. Now you, is the right time for you to consider a term policy. And here is why you should buy a term policy. Not because we want to sell it to you and make a commission, but because if you have a family and if you are not there, you need to make sure that your family is taken care of. So I think the discussion in, in this whole uh, using these technologies and these tools is to take the discussion to a point which is consumer first rather than platform first and insurer first and say, look, these are the kind of things that we can sense that you have and, you know, please uh, sort of consider these products. So those are the kind of uh, work that we are doing. And that is the kind of, I think, is the future of uh, where this industry is also headed. Well, thanks, Arvir. And uh, it is it is quite, uh, I'd say, ideal that, you know, you, you refer to technology as the slave of man because the uh, the fear forever, right from when science fiction has been written, there have been some, you know, repetitive thoughts, you know, the themes which have kept coming. And one of the, that are robots overturning, you know, humans and coming and killing everybody, the, you know, uh, old prehistoric beasts and coming. We, we are always, you know, lying in fear of extinction. So uh, I, I guess that's a very comforting thought that you've put that finally we have to use technology and not let technology be, be led by technology, right? Uh, yeah, and you, it's, it's, so it is, it is very, you know, nice because a question has come up from Aman Gupta and I, I'll pose this question, uh, not to you first, but for to Sachin first, then it's a, it's exactly in the line of that, but the re real opposite. Will robo advisory play a vital role in insurtech in the future? Sachin, what do you feel? 
I, I, I think certainly, uh, Jaideep, uh, it certainly will play a role uh, as, as we progress. Uh, some of these technologies which are uh, at, at the nascent stages, uh, there is some bit of evolution needed for them to be uh, suited for commercial use, uh, for enterprise use. But uh, like, you, like you mentioned, I think that the things that we have to watch out for is uh, a lot being talked about artificial intelligence, etc. And, and, and by the way, we use a lot of that in our organization already. What one needs to look at is uh, they should not start building in biases into uh, the model because some of these autom autonomous systems, that's one thing that we all need to uh, we need to watch out for. So long as we do that, uh, robo advisory is definitely uh, uh, the way to go. Uh, you it it gives you the ability to standardize uh, what's happening on the field for you, and more importantly, uh, we, we talked about hyper personalization you can actually uh, identify needs of a certain category and at a very, very small uh, category level of the customers and then advise uh, them on that particular need and identify the right offering. And it could be a combination of offerings uh, for the customer. So, so yeah, my, my view is uh, definitely it's the way to go. So, so there's been a very lovely question which has come from Webhav Vyas. And that question I'll pose to you Sarveer, because that will be a perfect segue back to Rajak, because this is it, the question is, is for APIs. It's about APIs. It, uh, uh, it says uh, the web of Vyas is asking, is it that is it really difficult for brokers? So he, he actually stating it is really difficult for brokers to collaborate with insurance companies for their APIs. And how do you think it is going to change? So what do you think, Safi? Is it, is it being difficult for you to have APIs with insurers? Before we go back to Rajat on the, on the, on the real thing about APIs, yeah. I think, Jaydeep, the, the question can be you know looked at at various levels. But if I were to be very practical about what uh, Weber is asking, it is difficult if you are starting out this journey. And I think, uh, you know, we have, I would say, I would dare say that we have you know developed a lot of expertise around how to work with insurers. Because, you know, insurers is not a common, I mean, it's not like one, uh, you know, one thing, right? Different insurers are at different levels of technology adoption. Uh, some have in-house teams, some use external teams. So, you know, it makes a difference based on that. So, I think the, the what I would suggest to Weber is that it's a journey. And initially, it does seem intimidating. And initially, there are a lot of roadblocks in terms of saying we can't do this and we can't do that. But eventually, see, the reality is insurers and, uh, you know, intermediaries are both in the service of the consumer. And if we can, you know, as long as the business volume is there, as long as we have, uh, you know, have a reason to exist. See, intermediaries must have a reason to exist. And if you have a reason to exist, then eventually the insurers will work with you. So I would suggest that he kind of work through the teething challenges because it's worth it. Because when you get to the other side, like we have, then, you know, your consumers get a fantastic experience. They are able to see, you know, where they stand with respect to the insurer, with respect to service, with respect to claims. And then, you know, that will hopefully give Weber also more business, uh, assuming he's a broker. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so great. So now that we've established that while getting APIs might be difficult, but get them, we we, should, we have to, right? And we'll get them working. Rajat, back to you. Uh, and uh, time permitting, we'll take one more audience question at the end. Uh, so Rajat, uh, back to you. And what do you think are the pillars on which this entire thing of accelerations can can happen what what, what technological pillars or what philosophical fi uh, pillars we should base our technology disruptions on sure. uh the slide is on the first slide yeah? on the sure so, sure so so Jaydeep, uh Sarbir, uh and Vaibhav. so the answer lies that yes uh for me we i we believe that yes i mean there are a lot of startups Funding is a problem, you know, cash flow is a problem for startups and creating tech is not easy, right? And many insurers probably are not uh, there to, you know, offer these APIs because they don't even know the relevance of these small brokers and startups. So that is where we guys come into picture and just give, uh, take a minute to come to that stage and uh, understand, make you understand how we are doing this for brokers, small brokers and startups as well. But let me give you a context to who we are uh, and how we've changed as an organization in the last three, four years. So we started in 2000. Uh, we were one of the first ones to come out with a Java browser-based core insurance systems in 2000 when, you know, insurers were working on AS400-based systems. I think some of them are still, but we were 20 years back. We were the first ones to, you know, say that, yes, we can do a browser-based Java-based system. Since then, we've grown uh, massively. Uh, 200 plus insurers, customers we have globally around, we're present in our 30 plus countries, around 1800 employees. Uh, software business, we have around 150 plus customers in the last 20 years. 
cloud business, which was started almost uh, three and a half, four years back, we've already crossed around 150. So you can see the amount of speed and velocity, how we've grown. Uh, we're present in all life, general and health uh, business lines. So insurance is what we live and breathe. Uh, we don't understand anything else. Uh, cloud uh, for us is is, is a layer of uh, pass, which are more. Middle office is effectively a platform as a service model where we have a product factory which has pre-configured products, more than 3,000 plus pre-configured products, a lot of SKUs that can be done on those product factories. We have our own service management platform. Uh, there's own uh, eBAO microservices and APIs, which effectively can be used by brokers and startups to create their own customer journeys. We also bring a lot of third-party APIs, uh, payments, uh, machine learning, IoT, et cetera, as well. Then we have our own SaaS applications, broker applications, intermediary portals, claim portals, or digital core as well, which can be powered by these APIs, right? And then third-party applications as well get powered by a lot of these APIs. We power a lot of ecosystem as well, uh, auto dealer, uh, brokers, uh, you know, health ecosystems, and a lot of other insurance applications as well. In terms of uh, how this is structured and how Insurmo is powering this, this, this talks about it all. So Insurmo, which is a middleware, middle office platform, is powering all these players somewhere or the other. So we obviously work with carriers. Uh, that's that's a bread and button. So we work with almost uh, you know hundred plus carriers, uh, and you can imagine a use case of a two weeks go live with this, which is one channel and one product, right to powering a six point five billion dollar organization, which is running all their premiums on this platform, building a digital core. So anything in between that is something that we're powering insurers to build their use cases and platforms on. We're completely partner driven. We work with a lot of partners to deliver the end applications. Uh, cloud for us, channels is a very big play. So we work with e-commerce, uh, wallets, banks, uh, any kinds of uh, you know uh, health, wellness companies. So anything that you see from a channels perspective, we either work with them as customers or we connect with them as channels. Startups, uh, I think this addresses question of Weber. We work with a lot of startups. We offer this platform for free. And when I say we offer this platform for free, it means there are APIs, there are products. And startups, which are probably into their seed stage, they have not come to a series A, they would generally take these APIs and build their apps and their user journeys and go live. And we tie down our success to the success of them. So it's, it's completely outcome and fee based to the success fee that they do. So that is how we're powering a lot of startups to go out there and create those insurtics for the ecosystem. We work with a lot of software vendors as well, a uh, lot of CRM companies, a lot of uh, ex eBow competitors as well, where we're powering them to come to the next stage of their uh, user applications as well. Then obviously ecosystems on the auto mobility health and the broker agent side is something that we are already doing. Uh, finally, last slide for me, uh, that is what we are powering, uh, three Vs of Insurmo. And these three Vs are real three Vs, uh, what we are doing for the insurance industry, uh, all real live numbers. So velocity, variation, and volumes. That is what we live and breathe on. And that is what we power our uh, customers with. When we say velocity, we are talking of launching a channel in a single day. You don't have to wait for multiple rounds of integrations. SIT, UAT spends millions of dollars to connect to a channel. Uh, you do it in a day's time, right? Launch a new product in less than a week's time. Uh, most complex product, probably a week and a half. That's what we aim at. Uh, all these products are already av available. You create your SKUs, get your APIs, and off you go. Uh, a real life case is in India itself, a large MNC life insurer, which is working on a two speed model with a legacy core uh, back office, which have taken insurance on a two speed model on top of the legacy core to drive this velocity and they've already launched multiple channels and multiple products just in a matter of three to four months. Variation, uh, I've already mentioned 3000 plus products that itself covers probably anything in the world. I have not seen any product which is not in this product factory or product library. On every product, there are multiple SKUs as well. So you take a master product and you create any kind of a marketable product as well. So this is what we call as SKUs. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, e-commerce company in India. They're already using this to drive that variation as well as velocity on the platform, both for life, general and health as well. Volumes, uh, uh, we are already issuing around 50K average policy volume count. So 50,000 policies are getting issued on this platform on a daily basis and average. And if I look at a peak hit that we've hit to show you the elasticity of this platform, we've done around 65 million policies in 24 hours. That talks of the velocity of what this platform can do for a small startup, which is just emerging that to a $6.5 billion general insurer, which is trying to issue that kind of volumes. So that is where insurance is moving. And they've already there. Some players started the journey almost three years back and some have actually realized this after COVID happening. So for us, we see huge amount of innovation and that's where we guys are living and living uh, in the insurance space. Thanks. Very impressive, Rajat. And uh, I think these could be quite the mantras of uh, technology disruption as we move ahead because we have to base it on certain uh, definitely on certain pillars and 
you know, your velocity, variation, uh, variance, or variation, and volume seem to be worthy causes. And that, thank you for that. So we have just a couple of questions before we wrap up. So there's an interesting question: How do you see micro and nano insurance products coming up in the next five to ten odd years? Does the industry have enough data for rolling out products in the space? Is a question from Janak Satra. Very interesting in in especially uh, with your uh, you know espousement of the the volume as we just spoke of. What you you spoke of massive volumes in a single day. So yeah. maybe you can uh, you can take this uh, question and answer very quickly. How do you see nano insurance and micro insurance in the coming it's, years? It's it's very it's very real, and I think that the volume game is all about uh, long tail. Uh, bite size sachet products and it's it's no longer uh, it's it's in asia yes I'm, i'm i'm not talking of us and europe markets right now i'm talking of asian context especially you know when products traditional products like life uh, and auto motor insurance products or travel insurance products have taken a hit so that mm-hmm. is where these bite size sachet products which are more contextual in nature and that's again i'm picking on a point of such an is the theme and i think that is where this 65 million policies come come from as well Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Rajat. And last question. Uh, we are having some good questions coming up right at the very end. I wish they're <laughs> beginning with more time that time. But this is this is a this is a worthy question with no direct answer. So maybe I'll take it. Which is how to boost insurance penetration in India, which currently is in single digit percentage. Is a question from Rajat Jain. So Rajat, uh, I think you have to look at it this way. We are our penetration is measured currently as a percentage of premium price, a percentage of GDP, which is a Maybe okay measure for life insurance, but nowhere a good measure for general insurance. But general insurance is the amount of some insured growth has to be seen, and how much of the GDP you protect you are protecting rather than how much premium you're charging. Because as you keep growing your base, your premiums keep falling because of the universality of that and the uh, rooting out of anti-selection. So, uh, it, however, I mean as an acceptable measure, if you take the premium also to 3.2 percent, not bad. But it needs to go to somewhere near the world average of six and a half percent. If that has to happen, there has to be measures rolled out from government, measures from regulators, measures from companies themselves, and maybe in that order, the government can take care of tax incentives. Government take care of rolling out mandatory stuff like the Ayushman Bharat, right? Other like other similar such stuff like maybe homes above two fifty square feet can be have to be all mandatory insured. Uh, all the motor cars which are not insured in the country today can be you know it can be enforced so and so forth from the regulator side distribution reforms opening up of further distribution channels and a bit of uh, you know relaxation of uh, controls which can happen as risk based uh, you know capital and risk based supervision comes on in the next couple of years i think that's important and finally from the company side is investment in the area uh, penetration areas which means getting out of the top 20 cities and moving further down the the trouble today is the cost of acquisition and so therefore that has to be conquered by the company so these are the ways typically a, a direction will go and be careful of what you wish for because too much of insurance is also not not good for an economy which is not ready for it imagine your plumber coming and asking and doubling his charge to just change a tap just because he has professional indemnity cover it's it's going to be difficult uh, so affordability of of uh, all products and services is an is something which is adversely affected by too much of insurance penetration so I, i think we have to move in in right pace right so with that we are almost near the very end so any last words uh, maybe just 10 seconds from everybody all the speakers starting with sachin uh, rajat and sardeep sachin any thoughts so, uh... and Yes, Chaydeep. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, uh, digital has to really serve the customer needs, uh, help simplify the processes, give a view of end-to-end delivery to the customer, and that is what we at Tata IIA have been constantly uh, uh, focused on by bringing innovation both in process, in terms of service offerings uh, that are all powered through digital. So I see a, a bright future ahead with with digital really taking center stage. Thank you. Simplification is the key, no doubt. We can't get anywhere by complicating matters just because we want to do it. Excellent point. Yup, uh, Sarveen. Yeah, I think uh, Jaydeep has a closing thought. I mean, just like uh, technology has touched every other part of our life, I think insurance uh, is not going to be an exception. Uh, there are opportunities both uh, for new and existing players to do better, and uh, I, I feel, like I said, that technology can allow us to do things that were not possible earlier, and I think that's where the focus should be. uh i i believe that too often the focus is on just doing the same things again and again i think the focus has to be to identify the gaps and do things better 
and if for anyone who's watching from a you know startup perspective i think you know you should start from the consumer and that will give you the right uh, direction excellent. excellent rajat thanks i think uh, uh... I, I strongly believe that India, what India is right now is going through, it's it's a huge tech disruption which is going to happen. But India stack playing a real role. All startups coming into picture and large corporates also spending uh, to going digital. So I, I strongly believe that there is a huge amount of uh, uh, you know a tech roadshow which is going to happen in the next four to five years in India, and I'm just looking forward to that. Thank you very much. And uh, the, the therefore to summarize these last thoughts, we are saying simplification is the key. We are saying. Start with the consumer is a key in mind, and we are also saying that uh, we have to really look forward to the revolution, invest, and move along. Uh, thank you, thanks everybody. Wonderful discussion. Thank you, Raja. Thank you, Sarveer, and thank you, Sachin. Thanks to IMAI for organizing this. And with this, we come to a close of the session. Thanks very much. Thank you so much to all thanks. our speakers and to Jody sir for moderating the session such wonderfully. A special thanks to our session partner, Eva Tech, for this session. Thank you, everyone. Please stay tuned for more such exciting sessions.